Hello, my TV. My name is Alicia. I'm your host as usual. Today I'm here with Trevor Doyle, who is a director and producer. And we're going to talk about some of his projects, his upbringing, and what's led him to these new projects that he has coming out. And I want to start with asking you how you are and sort of where, where um, you're coming from right now. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Um, I'm doing great, and I mean, are you mean where I came from? Yeah, right? yeah, like, like, are you LA based right now? Yeah, I'm LA. I'm yeah. LA based. Um, I do a lot of uh, a lot of films in Central Asia, mm -hmm. but I also work in Europe and uh, North America as well. Yeah, I think it's important because you weren't here initially when you started your uh, filmmaking journey. You got a lot of ideas from elsewhere, right? Yes, absolutely. So, can we start with sort of where? You grew up, and then where that took you in terms of life, and, and sure. what made you want to go back? So uh, I grew up in Southern California, uh, mostly in North Hollywood. Uh, both my parents were actors, and uh, I grew up in the industry and wanted nothing to do with it. I was completely disinterested. Uh, I, ba I basically joined the army when I got out of high school. So uh, I joined the army and. When I got out of the army, I went to study in Finland, and uh, I did my study, my basic studies in Finland, uh, cultural anthropology, archaeology, and then I became an archaeologist for the National Museum. That's really incredible. Um, you were telling me something interesting about um, sort of. Can you tell me a little bit about that pearl story? That was really interesting to me. Oh yeah. yeah. So so the the last dig that I was on before I came back to Los Angeles to work in film. Uh, I was working for the National Board of Antiquities, and we had we had new people on a dig, and there was this there was this young woman on the dig, and it's really typical when people just graduate and they, they work on a dig, they think everything in front of them is something important, and she kept telling me that you know she found a ship, and I thought it was the most absurd thing I'd ever heard in my life. I'm like, come on, there's there's not a ship, and she she did it time after time, and finally she's like, I got something. I looked, and there's this little tiny like white bulb. And I, I was like, I should probably take a picture. So I took a picture of it and I sent it to the, uh, the dig leader who was in charge of all the region. And the dig leader was like, stop what you're doing. Called me immediately and said, that's a Viking pearl. And I was like, I didn't even know what a Viking pearl was. And then I, I crawled up on a truck and I stood over and I looked at the whole dig site and I realized that she was absolutely right. She had unearthed <laughs> a ship that had been completely dismantled. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's so interesting that you're an, an, an archaeologist because I think it's played into some of your later later projects, right? Uh, so I want to I wanna talk about sort of you joined the military, right? And then you got to a cool job as well when you were, where you were like with the deer and things like that. Oh yeah, yeah. so when, when, I, when I got out of the military um, uh, and I was working, there was a brief period where my girlfriend at the time uh, she was Sami, they're the native reindeer herding people in the Circumpolar North, mm -hmm. and uh, both of her parents uh, fell ill. Her, her dad broke both of his shoulders, mom had really serious uh, arthritis, and they were going to lose their herd of reindeer. So I, I went up to the Norwegian border of Finland, and I got certified as a reindeer herder, and I spent a year uh, basically going back and forth with the herd, and uh, while I was doing that, I met these World War II veterans. They're called Winter War veterans in Finland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, they didn't usually have people they could talk to, but because I was a Gulf War veteran, they felt kind of comfortable talking to me. And also because I was a foreigner, they knew I wasn't going to be talking to other people, so they would told me stuff that they wouldn't normally tell other people. Mm -hmm. But they kept referring to this woman mm -hmm. saying, you know, how she'd saved the, the, the villages. And after a while, I was like, well, was she a soldier? And they, they, they reacted like, what are, you, what are you talking about? That's absurd. No, she, she was a postmaster. And I was like, well, that doesn't <laughs> help me a whole lot with this. And so uh, then they told me that what she had done, so she delivered the mail to all the different villages. And at the time, uh, all of the children and the teenagers um, were in charge of the farms because the mothers had gone to be with the Lotas, and the Lotas were these uh, anti-aircraft artillery women. And they were firing when the Russians would come across, they would, they would fire at them. Mm -hmm. And then the men had gone to fight like on the border. Um, so there, there were no adults around. And at this particular time, there were, uh, there were Nazis uh, 
in, in Finland, in the north, who were supposedly going to defend Finland against a Russian invasion. When the Russians saw it, they basically warned Finland, if you don't get them out, we're going to invade. So she knew something bad was going to happen, and she, because nobody noticed her, because she was just the postmaster, she was able to go to all the children in the village, and she talked to the teenagers that she trusted the most and said, one night I'm going to come, and when I do, you need to be ready. Everything's got to be packed because we're going to go somewhere. And she picked the night, and, and just as it would, not only did she pick the right night, but the very next day, um, the Nazis were kicked out, and they burned Lapland to the ground. So all of the villages, everything was burned to the ground. There was nothing left. And when the parents came back, they thought that their children were dead and their livestock were gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, a year later, Eileen came back with the children, like the Pied Piper and all of the livestock, and they were able to rebuild all the villages. And I was like, I can't not have this story <laughs> be told. Mm -hmm. So I, I went down south, and I, I spoke to a film board, and they gave me a camera, and I went back up, and I did a research documentary mm -hmm. about it. And when I was done, I was like, I, I think I like telling these kinds of stories better than doing the archaeology. Yeah, that's incredible. Coming from, you said your, both your parents were actors, right? Yeah. And you didn't want anything to do with film? Nothing to do with it. So what gave you the courage to really, because getting the film funded is very difficult, right? Especially as a new filmmaker. But you, you said you just did it with one camera, right? I just did it with one camera. I didn't have, I didn't have funding, really. Yeah. I, had, I had a camera. <laughs> yeah. And, and as for the structure of it, did you know what you wanted? Did you do just interview-based? I mean, it was interview-based. I really didn't know exactly what I was, it, it was one of those things where, I would interview people, and as the as the story unfolded before me, I got a better idea of what I wanted to do as it was going. And um, I, I realized that I, I realized because I, I figured archaeology is such a completely different field, but but then I started to understand that what I was doing as an archaeologist was I was uncovering artifacts, and then I was kind of reverse engineering a story based on what I had uncovered. Mm -hmm. So it actually wasn't such a different discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it actually helped prepare me for what I ended up going on to do. Did you get to meet her? Oh yeah, I got I got to meet Eileen. She was totally amazing. She's this itsy bitsy little lady, like a seven pound woman who used to carry a six gun <laughs> in her waistband, she said, for Russians and bears. <laughs> and uh, she used to she used to carry her body weight in mail when she did the deliveries, which is also, you know, and, and in the winter she had to do it in the snow, so she would ski. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she was a really, a really amazing lady, really brave, and uh, of course, every village basically up in Lapland is there because of her. Yeah. So. So they all know her name and everything. Oh, everybody yeah. knows Eileen. <laughs> <Big piece of laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Do you know, are you the first person to do a documentary on her? Oh yeah, nobody, nobody wow. had done. What I would really love to do now, yeah. now that I, I've I've got years under my belt, I would like to go back. So, some of the children and teenagers, right before they left, you know, in in Lapland in that place, they have twenty four hours of sunlight in the midsummer, um, and they usually have a dance. And they had had a dance, and there were some love affairs that happened, and. And, you know, there were some fights and arguments as, as kids have. Mm -hmm. And um, there's still some of those those kids alive. Mm -hmm. And what I would love to do is I'd like to go back, do more of a feature documentary using some of the original footage I had. And then I would like to take all of those people in a bus back over to Sweden to the village that they've never been to since the war mm -hmm. and have... Uh, a midsummer dance with everyone again. Mm, that's incredible. That would be my. <laughs> and this all started because you got that job as a deer herder, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Okay, so you do this documentary, and and then you do you come to LA right after? Uh, yeah, I, I came to LA right after. Um, I I worked, so. I, the first thing I did when I came back is I I worked uh, in a special effects studio, and I. I was making parts basically for for films. Like I, I made all the lower receivers for the blaster rifles and the Star Trek Redux, and then um, I worked on this big project um, for for this guy Jim Key, and uh, we actually made all, basically all of the uh, six foot replicas of the Battlestar Galactica ships that are in the museums around the U.S. Uh, 
I made all the parts for them. I didn't build them, but I, but I actually made the parts for them. <laughs> Do you find a correlation between archaeology and what you were doing on these projects with these ships? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because uh, once, you, once you get stuff, once you actually find things as an archaeologist, you have to conserve it. And when you're conserving it, you know, you, you've got you've to clean it, mm -hmm. and, and you, you've got to mark what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and a big part of building those ships was we had to actually go online and look for models that have been built because the original Battlestar Galactica ships were all built from World War One and World War II uh, uh, machines. Mm -hmm. So, so they they were actually from models, and the parts were no longer around. So we had to go online, find people that had old model builds, buy the model builds, mm -hmm. then make new molds. Mm -hmm. So it actually. There was a lot of correlation yeah. between, between of the two. Attention to detail too. And and I actually what what I didn't when we finished shooting them or, or, or we call it shooting when it's a two part mold, um, when we finished making the uh, the parts and the ships were built by by the artists that were doing them, um, they brought a cameraman in to do an old fashioned run of the ship so that it looked like you know it was it was flying in space and I helped the cameraman and when when we were done the cameraman was like you should be doing this you're good at this, mm -hmm. and that's that's when I stepped into doing DP work. From there, when, when does your new project come in that's your own? Oh, so, well, I mean, I've, I had some projects after that, but the real, the real beginning of producing in my company uh, was, was a film, uh, it was a film called The Steed, and uh, we really kind of started on The Steed around 2015. Um, it took many years to make, we, we had to, uh, we had to get foals to train to be in it. It's about a boy and a horse in Mongolia. And uh, if you know horses, you know that um, although they're really amazing uh, creatures, they don't always want to do exactly what you tell them to do. So if you, want, if you want a horse that can do everything, what you really should do is you should train four horses. You know, and, and you pick each horse that has the right personality and the right traits to be all the different people so that's that's what we did is we we, we got actually four foals mm -hmm. and uh we had a horse master who trained them mm -hmm. and that took two years and then it took three years to shoot the whole thing we shot in the gobi desert we shot in the plains we shot in the mongolian highlands um we had three thousand horses on set um 50 camels around three thousand uh, sheep and goats 300 extras i mean it was it was a massive undertaking mm -hmm. um and it was really a privilege and an honor to be able to shoot with the people that we shot with. And we had, we had famous Russian actors, famous Kazakh actors, famous Mongolian actors. Um, and they're all, I mean, I, I've really, I've grown to truly appreciate uh, the acting talent that's in Central Asia. So uh, it, was, it was really, it was fun. It was a lot of fun to shoot and uh, our director, um, he's originally a nomad. Uh, his name is Erden Billy Gambold. Um, but that's another reason why we were able to do what we were able to do because anywhere we went, the nomads knew who he was, and if we needed help, we, we needed anything, they, they were there. Yeah. As to the beginning of this story, what made you want to tell the story? Because there's stigma around the, the Mongols and stuff like yeah. that, right? Yeah, well, I mean, what really. So. I like to make films that really explain a culture, and uh, I think one of the things that's really beautiful about uh, traveling and learning about new cultures and new people is it's like what makes us different is, is usually what I think is the most special. And usually what you find out is the things that we see as being different are actually a doorway into the fact that we're all the same. Mm -hmm. and, and so like, Usually when you see movies about Mongolians, it's about conquering and, and, and uh, swords and, and killing. And that's not really Mongolian culture. That is part of what happened with a particular empire that was Mongolian. And, you know, it's like what really appealed to me about the story was that it was about Mongolian culture. It was about how they view their relationship with the land, their relationship with animals, and also how they, they, they love each other mm -hmm. um, and how close they are as family. Mm -hmm. And like one, one of the things that we, we highlighted in the film, and it, it's like when I see it, it still gives me goosebumps. Uh, you know, Mongolians are not as demonstrative, I would say, as, as, as like we would, we would think, especially with children. Mm -hmm. 
but there's this one thing that they do, and I was like, when I saw it, I was like, okay, this this has got to be in the film like multiple times because it's so it's so. Uh, but uh, when they when there's somebody younger than you that you love and care about, um, you don't really hug them, but they they come up to you and they kind of bow their head and then you cup the back of their head and bring it under your nose and you you just kind of it's like you're inhaling mm -hmm. them and it's it's it. It initially looks like you're like, what, what's going on? Mm -hmm. But you really start to see how how much it's a, a, a proof of the love and, and, yeah. and compassion that they have for one another, and it's, it's really special. Oh, it's like their form of an embrace. Yeah. Some sort of, oh, yeah. that's so interesting. And, it's, and I feel like it's one of those things that you look at it, and at first it looks very foreign, yeah. but then you really start to understand. Well, I mean, this is the same thing as just like a hug and a kiss or something yeah. like that. It's, it's really, and that's the kind of stuff that we, we really look for when we're making films. Yeah. We want we want to connect people culturally in a way that maybe it looks different, but you really you really feel it and understand it when you see it. Oh, that's cool. So you wanted to put it in there multiple times because yeah. it's, it's very common. Yeah. In the film. yeah, that's really incredible. Okay, so as to that project, um, you you really tell stories about sort of it, it connected sort of to your background in in your studies, right? Yeah. Because you're a cultural anthropologist. So moving forward, have you done more of that in your future works? Do you believe in telling stories about other cultures? Oh yeah, we've, we've definitely, I mean, <laughs> I also made uh, Finland's first uh, superhero movie. Oh. And uh, there's a lot of Finnish culture inside of that. Finns are, uh, they're very funny people because they're very quiet, um, but, they can also be uh, really out there. They can do a lot of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like with that movie in particular, uh, people really got to get an idea of what Finns could be like. Uh, and it was interesting to make something, you know, because a lot of times when you, when you try and make a film that connects with people culturally, you're trying to do it with something that's more historical because you're kind of taking a look back and like this was fun because it was a modern film yeah. and it was talking about modern culture and we used a lot of humor inside of it and that humor um i think that humor is one of the things that that uh it gets people interested in watching it because it's like even though it's a superhero movie and there's people getting punched and stuff like that there's just this odd sort of they're very self-deprecating in their humor so yeah. what's what was the superpower that this superhero so has? so um his superpower was uh, he was exposed to a chemical that that, uh, that essentially made him impervious. A um, little bit like Superman, except that he wasn't strong. Oh, okay. um, and and it, it's like, I guess maybe less impervious and more like like a revenant. Oh. Like like you could shoot him and hurt him, but he what he just get up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, that's really cool. I didn't, I didn't know that. That was that's a really good project, actually. Hopefully, you check it out. So you have one that's in the make right now, or you said you're doing a sort of a prequel, and but you had an original film as well, right? Well, so we we had a film called Aberrance, um, and and that film was was uh, at uh, South by Southwest, mm -hmm. and in 2023, mm -hmm. and uh, we were in the Midnighter section. It was South by Southwest was amazing, mm -hmm. uh, and just being able to be there was you know was quite an honor and and knowing that your film is you know uh going up against evil dead rise mm -hmm. it's like <laughs> mm -hmm. huge huge film and yeah. so uh but yeah so we had aberrance and it was um it was a thriller and a horror movie mm -hmm. and it, it's it's kind of like a, the message is that we're all quietly complicit in allowing the governments of the world to feed off of us um, so it's, it's got an interesting message to it, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, once, once we finished making the film and we realized that it was getting the kind of, uh, audience and attention that it was, you know, because again, we're talking about connecting cultures and I, I feel like it did a really good job of making it clear that although this particular story is happening in Mongolia, it's kind of a story that happens in all countries and all cultures. Mm -hmm. So, um, we we got such a good response from it that we decided we needed to do more than than, than just one film mm -hmm. and so we decided to actually make uh, a prequel yeah. 
which we're, we're finishing up right now. And the prequel is not going to be a horror. It's, it's actually stepping out of the genre. And the prequel is going to be uh, a Western. Oh, it's, like yeah. a, it's like a Western yeah. thriller. Yeah. So, That's really cool. Why did you decide to go with that instead of like a sequel, for example? Well, so we wanted to create... You know, the idea actually is with, with, with film, uh, we wanted to create like a cinematic universe. And we want, because it's, it's a world where perhaps maybe the conspiracies that people talk about in this world that are not really true, yeah. the idea is it's kind of like a world where the conspiracies may actually be true. Mm -hmm. um, but we felt like in order to make that world interesting and vibrant, you should have content around it that is, uh, you know, across a genre. So you make a Western, maybe, maybe you could even make like a love story or something like, like a tragic love story. Mm -hmm. There could be a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And we have a plan to make multiple sequels in multiple languages. Mm -hmm. So, that, and that's that's in the mix right now. Oh, that's incredible. So there could be more after the prequel then, you're saying there's there should be There them. should be about six more films yeah. after the... And features? Are you doing all features? All features. That's amazing. That's, that's a lot of footage. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have one that's going to shoot in... This is a separate project, right? That you're shooting in India? Is that correct? Yeah, we got we got a separate project. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention about Aberrants. Oh, yeah, yeah. Before, before we move on. So, the, the director of Aberrants mm -hmm. was the DP on The Steed. Yeah. And that was one of, that was, it was really amazing to get to work with him in that capacity yeah. because like, and he came to me, he's like, I want to I wanna direct something, I want it to go international. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do? And I said, we need to do horror. And he's like, I don't like horror. Yeah. And I was like, well, what do you, what do you like? <laughs> and he's like, well, I like Darren Aronofsky. And I was like, well, I mean, that's close enough. Let's... <laughs> yeah. So the other one you said it's a western, right? The yeah. prequel. So it's horses, right? Are you doing more? Yeah, there's, there, there, it's, yeah. it's like that kind of, and and but it's it's less about the horses, mm -hmm. and it's more about just the setting. You know, you it's it's hard to explain. Yeah. Like you'll have to see it. Okay. Um, but you know, it's just a setting that that feels like you're in a ghost town somewhere, and and so it's it really feels like a western, but yeah. but it's it, it is modern. Yeah. Is it still like dystopian? Is that what it is? Oh, it's it's the same. It's the same cinematic universe. Yeah, so it's 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 actually about how one of the characters in the first film became who they were. Okay. So. Um, it's really interesting. Okay, you have to check it out. Yeah. And all the other ones that come with it. <laughs> That's really cool. Okay, and I also wanted to ask. So, do you work with the same crew? Have you because you have a production company right now? I have a production company. Yeah. I have a lot of people that I work with regularly. Yeah. Um, but it's not always the same people. When when we shoot in Mongolia, we shoot primarily with. Uh, a Mongolian crew, mm -hmm. and it's the same thing. Like I'm, I'm going to go to India to shoot this uh, this other film, yeah. and when we go there, it's going to be an Indian crew. Yeah. But we are bringing so the DP um, from the Steed and the director from Aberrants is going to come out and be the DP for for this film we shoot in India. Mm -hmm. But aside aside from him and his his uh, his crew, and then we, we're bringing one Mongolian um, uh, artist to come out and kind of do art direction. For the film, but the rest, the rest of the crew is going to be Indian. How do you go about finding the right people when you're moving to another country to do a film like this? Well, so it's not just that I'm bringing out the Mongolian crew that I've worked with before because I know them. Yeah. Um, Mongolia has very challenging uh, environments to shoot in, mm -hmm. um, and where we're going right for this next shoot, we're going to be shooting in in a, a Goan jungle that is. Uh, I think it has the highest density of uh, wild tigers in the world. Um, so we're basically, we're in a tiger infested <laughs> jungle with, um, it's, it's also apparently full of leeches. So we're going to be like covered in leeches and surrounded by tigers. Uh, and I was like, I, I, I need my, my Mongolian yeah. <laughs> tough people <Yeah. laughs> out here working because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible, but you know, it makes for great stories, so it's part of the process. Yeah, ab yeah. absolutely. And I also, I just wanted to mention the company that I have, it's called Three Flames Pictures because uh, there's three of us in it, and Erden Billy Gamble, the director from The Steve, he, yeah. he's one of the founding members, and then Alexa Khan is my is my partner at the uh, at the company. Yeah. And yourself as well, you're yeah. the third flame. Yeah, okay. we're the third flame. That's so. awesome, yeah, that's great. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about your upcoming, your India shoot then, okay? Yeah, okay. So, I think it's a really fascinating story, um, simply because it's it's one of those things that you, you barely ever hear about, but uh, it's based on a true story. A, a huge corporation was getting ready to destroy these 10,000-year-old sacred groves in India, 
and uh, the jungle dwellers that were there, uh, of course, didn't want that to happen. Um, and they warned, they warned the you know the oligarchs and this corporation, you know, don't don't come in here. And then what they actually did, the first thing they did, is they went in and tried to kill tigers, um, because the, because, because tigers are endangered, and it's one of the few places where they're they're at. So they figured they could get rid of the tigers. They could anyway. These people, um, they have knowledge of poisons that modern science has never had a chance to actually, uh, you know, categorize. So there's plants and things like that that no one's ever seen before in these sacred groves, mm -hmm. and they use they use the poisons from those plants to to basically terrorize these <laughs> oligarchs, and and there was no way for the doctors to fix the problems that were coming from the poisons, mm -hmm. and that's when they realized. Wow, there's there's nothing we can do against this, no matter how rich we are. So they eff effectively saved the forest. Yeah. So we're making a feature film about that story. How do you find these stories? Oh my goodness! I th I feel like the like I didn't actually find this. It feels yeah. like most of these stories come to me. It's yeah. like people people know they they look at my background and they're like, well, this guy's done so many bizarre <laughs> things that like I, I I feel like I can have a conversation with him about it and see. And I, you know, I, I feel like I get these great stories, and I'm, I'm super grateful for it. I'm, I'm grateful for the people who bring them to me. I'm grateful to the universe for, <laughs> for giving me a chance to tell the stories. And that's, that's really what this is all about, is getting a chance to tell stories that, that should be told and maybe don't always get the attention they deserve. Where are you in the, in the shooting process for this film? Are you in production? We're, we're not in production yet. We're, um, we're going to go into pre-production in August. First, we're going to go to Cannes. Um, and when we go to Cannes, we're, we're going to look and see if we can get uh, a pre-sale mm -hmm. for the film. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on whether or not we get a pre-sale, that will determine the end budget. Mm -hmm. but, but we have some pretty exciting people um, uh, attached to this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say the names yet until we start uh, production, but I'll definitely let you know when, mm -hmm. when, when it happens for certain. Yeah. I'm so sorry, was it a documentary or is it... No, it's a feature it's film. It's a feature film, It's okay. a feature film. No, as a matter of fact, so... Uh, one of the reasons why we don't want to do a documentary... Because um, it could be one. Oh, so it, easily, it, it right? could totally be a documentary, but we have to be very careful that we do not... Um, we do not cause trouble with, with the, the people in the forest. Oh, I see. They, yeah. they have essentially told us it's okay to make... Uh, a film that does not directly explain who they are and where they are. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> it's like they, they don't mind if we do that, but I, I don't want to get on the wrong side of these people. <laughs> yeah. So that's what you know. It allows you for creativity for yeah, the future, yeah, right? Yeah. That's incredible. Okay, so we'll look out for that. All right. Anything else coming up for you? Is that what your main focus is right now? I mean, really, the, I would say that the Indian Project is the is the major. Uh, the major. It's, it's like operative term is the poisoners, but that's not what yeah. we're going to call it. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I do have, I have a project that I'm going to be working on for about three weeks. Mm -hmm. It starts on Monday. Oh. <clears throat> and that's, um, it's going to be a Christmas movie. Mm -hmm. And I've, <clears throat> sorry, I'm something in my throat. Um, I worked on a Hulu Christmas movie uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I vowed I wouldn't work on another Christmas movie again after we did it, and uh, and here I am here you are. stepping into another Christmas movie. But I, I think this is going to be more fun. Yeah. They always shoot during the sunny season. Yeah, I know right? it's, it's crazy. It's like, 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 let's wait until it gets good and hot, yeah. so everybody can sweat while they're in front of. At like least a... it's not July. A lot of a lot of films do you know Christmas movies yeah. in July, but okay, that's really incredible. So, do you have a name already for it? Is it? No, I okay. I'm, I'm not. Can't say. Can't yeah. say. Okay. So as I'm coming to a wraps, is there any advice you have for any young filmmakers? You had a route, you started in your 30s, right, with this, but anything you can tell someone that wants to pick up a camera for the first time? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, first off, I would say um, make sure that when you start doing something, the project that you pick is something that means so much to you that it doesn't matter what you're going to get in return for doing it because uh, most first projects, although everybody has you know high hopes, they don't turn out the way you want. You're not going to make the kind of money you think you're going to make. And um, <clears throat> if it's if it's not looked at in the way that you hoped, 
at least if you did something that you really cared about, um, you can kind of sit back and feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Because I, I tell people every film that's made is a minor miracle. And even if the film that you made is not what you were hoping it was going to be, you should take a minute and just be like, well, I, I did make a film and not very many people can say that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one really big uh, mm -hmm. point. And then the other thing I would say, and this is, this is more nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. um, because the, the film industry has changed. It's, it's, I mean, it's completely different than it was five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would tell people is do not make a movie and then try and sell it. Very, very bad. I, everybody wants to make a movie and then try and sell it. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you at least go out and, and get the temperature checked for whether or not somebody wants to buy it. Mm -hmm. Because what you really want to do is you want to figure out the end of the rainbow for your project before you even start it. If you if you you can do that now, it's very it's very possible. It's like the the, the industry is a lot more egalitarian than it used to be. It used to be impossible to talk to decision makers. Now you just have to have uh, some intestinal fortitude, and you just have to go at people and hey, I really want to talk to you about this project. And you know if if you hear me, but, you know hear me out. Let me let me tell you so. Uh, that's that's what I would say is you know try and try and get at least an idea of what you can sell it for before you try and make it. Okay, it's really good advice. It's different. It's different than what we've heard. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Where can we find you on socials and your website for your company? So uh, on Twitter or X, um, yes. and on on Instagram, it's the same. It's at tm doyle forty five, um, and then it's threeflamepictures.com. Mm -hmm. For the company. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Check it out and check out his works that are coming out and your previous works as well, right? Okay. Anything else? Any closing thoughts? Um, no, I mean, I had a great time. Thank yeah. you for this. Yeah, we had a great time having you. We've never had someone with a background like yours. Everyone is so different, but an archaeologist turned filmmaker. <laughs> that's incredible. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone at Mighty TV for watching and we hope you stay tuned for the next artist. Thank you.